In our last set of videos, we looked at um, states of matter by way of investigating phase diagrams. And what we're going to do now is we're going to drift kind of over to the bottom right side of those phase diagrams and look at the behavior of gases. And we're going to do it through the lens of a thing called the kinetic theory of matter. And the kinetic theory of matter is simply states that um, the properties of a particular sample of matter can be investigated and inferred by reference to what's going on with their individual particles at the atomic molecular level. Um, we have here by way of introduction a famous piece of uh, artwork by Joseph Wright called An Experiment on a Bird in the Air Pump. And um, this um, art is really referencing back to events um, that began about 100 years earlier when Robert Boyle um, commissioned some of the early air pumps to be built and then they were taken around um, to various scientific meetings and used as um, demonstration tools. And here we have in the globe this poor little birdie flying around and we're getting ready to take all the air out of that globe. And you might imagine what would happen to the bird. And there are certainly people in this picture that already have an imagination for what's getting ready to take place. Uh, before we dive into talking about um, the gases, let's kind of recap the properties of the states of matter. Um, and so if we start with solids, solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. Um, they tend to not change in the absence of um, external forces. Uh, liquids, where they also have a definite volume, um, will tend to take the shape of their container and you can, of course, pour them from one container to another um, because they have this property of being able to flow their particles moving past one another. Uh, gases will take both the volume and the shape of their container and they also have the property of being able to flow. Um, for the similarities of solids and gases, both having definite volumes, we tend to refer to them as the incompressible states. Um, and because liquids and gases both take the shape of their container and flow, we generally refer to them as their fluid states. But now what we're gonna do again is we're gonna focus here just on this last one, the gases. Um, and we're gonna talk about that kinetic theory of matter and we're gonna focus it particularly on the kinetic theory of gases. The kinetic theory of gases says that we can um, think about the macroscopic properties, the measurements we might be able to take um, that would describe the state of the gas in that box um, by reference to um, what's going on with those individual particles. And there are three um, primary uh, kinetic um, properties or variables um, that we might consider when doing this. And the first is temperature. Um, temperature is um, scientifically in a way defined as the average kinetic energy of particles in a sample of matter. So you can see the arrows on our little gas particles here. Um, that's supposed to designate the direction and speed of those particles. And so temperature would be um, to average all of those energies um, and give us some particular value. And at low temperatures, the particles would be moving fairly slowly. And at higher temperatures, they would be moving faster. Second property you might be interested in is pressure. Um, pressure is a force exerted over an area. And so here you could think about um, the particles slamming into the sides of the container, um, exerting a force on the container, and that would be the pressure of the gas inside the container. And then our last um, property, uh, our kinetic property uh, for gases is gonna be the volume. What kind of space is free for those particles to move around in? So what I wanna do is I wanna go and kind of break each of these properties down and kind of discuss how they are and what they work. So a uh, general definition of pressure is pressure is force per unit area. In an equation, that's gonna be pressure is equal to F over A. And so if we think about this object here um, now resting on a surface, the cylinder has a, has a force um, and it's gravity that exerts a force pulling its weight down towards that surface. And then the weight is distributed over the um, base of that cylinder, which is in contact with the surface that the cylinder is on. Um, that force or that weight of the object is measured uh, with an equation. Uh, this is actually one of Newton's laws. 
mass times acceleration, mass of the object that we can weigh on a balance, and acceleration due to the force of gravity, uh, which uh, it's on Earth, sea level average is to be about 9.8 meters per second squared. And so if we were to look at how those units are going to break down, mass is measured in kilograms in the SI system, and accelerations change in speed over time. So change in meters per second for every second that you're traveling is going to be meters per second squared. And that combination of units, kilograms, meters per second squared, is called a Newton, named after Isaac Newton, and that's our SI unit of force. Well, remember we said pressure is force over area, so let's take that Newton and divide it by area, which is length squared. And of course the length unit in the SI system is meters squared. So pressure is going to be a Newton per meter squared or a kilogram meter per second squared over meter squared. So if we do a little canceling there. We know we're going to lose one of those meters on the, uh, we're going to lose that meter on the top. We're going to lose one of the meters on the bottom. You're going to end up with this uh, set of base units, kilograms over second squared meters. In the SI system, we refer to that as a Pascal. The Pascal is the SI unit of pressure. You really don't need to track all of these equations now. You will need them when you take physics. Right now, this was just to show you how you come about with the unit of pressure in the SI system, which is called a Pascal. And one of the kind of great, or at least the fun, applications of pressure is ice skating. Ice skating operates on the idea that you can take your entire body weight and distribute it over a very small surface area and generate a very high pressure. And if you look at this last image that's come up on the screen here, um, this is an image of a sharpened um, ice skating blade, um, super magnified, of course. And when you sharpen an ice, uh, ice skate blade, you actually sharpen it concave. So you actually have these two edges and a channel down the middle. And your body weight on those tiny edges of metal generates a lot of pressure, which when you're gliding across the ice, then is going to melt that ice under the force of that friction. And it's going to create this channel of water that is going to move um, uh, through that blade. And it actually allows you that really nice gliding motion. You're really, when you're ice skating, you're ice skating on a layer of water on a layer of ice. Let's talk real quick about how to measure pressure. So the um, object that we use to measure pressure is called a barometer. And here you have kind of an old time mercury barometer on the left in this image. And kind of the original design for this comes from a guy by the name of Evangelista Torricelli. Um, you can kind of see his, his timeline there. And his original design for the barometer, he took a, a, a tube which had markings on it filled it all the way up with mercury and covered it and then inverted it in a bowl of mercury. And you'll notice he's dipping his entire hand in that bowl there in this kind of recreated image. And back then they would have had no, um, or they didn't know that mercury absorbed through the skin and creates all kinds of problems. But um, you do get a really handy device here. So what you have now is you have two um, pressures working. You have the pressure of the liquid mercury in the tube kind of pushing mercury out of the tube. And you have atmospheric pressure pushing on the mercury in the bowl of tube, pushing mercury up into the tube. And you establish here uh, what we call a gradient. A gradient is just a difference between a high value and a low value of any measurement. And so initially when that tube is full, you have more pressure due to the liquid column of mercury in the tube then you have atmospheric pressure outside the tube. So the gradient goes from inside to outside. And matter will always move down a gradient. And so what happens is the pressure of that uh, mercury is going to push the liquid mercury down in the tube until that column of mercury exerts the same force as the atmospheric pressure on the outside. And what we find is average pressure at sea level will support a column of mercury about 760 millimeters high. And so one of our original measurements of pressure, we look at measures of standard pressure. So we here have STP and the P is kind of big right now because we're talking about pressure, is 760 millimeters of mercury. That's the height of a mercury column that average pressure at sea level will hold up. If we convert those millimeters of mercury into inches, um, we find that that same column of mercury measured in inches would be about 29.92 inches. 
uh, we refer to this value um, or it has reset we reestablished a unit much later on called the atmosphere um, where uh, one atmosphere is average pressure at sea level, two atmospheres is twice that pressure, so on and so forth. Uh, in the SI system, of course, we said we use the Pascal. Turns out a Pascal is a very small unit of pressure because um, the air around you actually exerts a pressure of 101.3 kilopascals, which is 1,000, so 101,300 uh, Pascals. Um, we see this number 760 again, so the millimeters of mercury at one point was uh, renamed Torricelli in honor of uh, Evangelista Torricelli, but we still probably use millimeters of mercury more often than we use Tor. Then that last one there, PSI, is probably the one you're the most familiar with, even though you may not be in your head right now, but maybe you take a second, see if you can think about what PSI means. So you would most likely see that airing up a bike tire or a car tire, right? Because PSI is the unit of pressure we typically use in that context, and it stands for pounds per square inch, right? So if you think about force per unit area, we're talking about pounds of force per square inch of area. And average pressure at sea level has a, a pressure of about 14.7 PSI. So this is what we refer to as atmospheric pressure values. And formally, these would have been considered our standard pressure values. Um, but we actually now have, well, not now, back in 1982, so it's been nearly 40 years, um, the international scientific community reestablished standard pressure to be 100 kilopascals instead of one atmosphere. They wanted to base standard pressure off the SI unit and not some non-standard unit. Um, well... This doesn't change much. You notice all the numbers are pretty close to the same, but it changes one pretty big thing because you'll remember a mole of any gas at standard temperature and pressure is 22.4 liters. But of course, if we change standard pressure, we also change that molar volume. So even though in the U.S. we still primarily use and teach 22.4 liters in our textbooks, most international textbooks use 22.7 liters. Now we're still going to stick with atmospheric pressure as standard pressure. But if you're going to go on and take Chem 2 next year, our curriculum is actually an international curriculum. And so we're going to relabel that standard pressure to be 100 kilopascals, which is going to change your molar volume there to 22.7. But for right now, still 22.4. Don't worry about that too much. Um, here's a cut right off of Wikipedia's website, uh, or a Wikipedia page, sorry, not the Wikipedia and the Wikipedia page shows you the different kind of institutions and what standard pressures and temperatures they use. And notice, you know, the international community's standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. Most places use something higher than that because zero degrees Celsius is actually kind of hard to work at. You'll notice there's a fair number of 100 kilopascals in the pressure line, but there's still even more 101.3s. So a good portion of the scientific community does, in fact, still use the old standard pressure, um, even though the, the official um, standard has been changed to 100 kilopascals. So things in flux. Let's talk about temperature. So remember temperature is the average kinetic energy of particles in a sample of matter. Temperature is not a measure of heat. Um, these are things that people get confused often. Um, and there are two different ways to go about thinking about this differentiation between heat and temperature. So the first way um, is to think about um, two things going on here. One is that temperature is a state property. I can measure um, the temperature of something at a given moment in time. Um, and that is like, again, you're taking a freeze frame of that object um, and you're measuring the kinetic energy of its particles at that one moment in time. It's a state property. But heat, on the other hand, is a transfer process. You can only measure heat as it's moving from a warm object to a cooler object. Um, and so you need a process to measure heat. Um, heat will always, by the way, move from a warm object to a cool object down a temperature gradient. Again, a gradient is just a difference between high and low. Um, Another way to think about the differ, uh, difference between heat and temperature, or at least to think about um, the idea that they have to be different, is here we have two containers at the same temperature. 
then it's not hard to think about a container that has a liquid at um, one temperature and a container that has more liquid at the same temperature. But imagine we were, these are the same liquids, imagine we were to heat them um, for the same amount of time at the same rate. Um, which one do you expect to be at a higher temperature after, say, five minutes of heating? Um, and hopefully you would recognize the one on the left would be at a higher temperature. So if you have more of a substance, you have a higher capacity for absorbing heat, even though both of those things are at the same temperature. So heat and temperature are different. Let's talk about standard temperature. So we talked about standard pressure. Standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. If we convert that to Kelvin, it's 273.15 Kelvin. And you may remember the conversion from Celsius to Kelvin is degrees Celsius plus 273.15 K. Um, so the math there is pretty easy to do. Also, hopefully most of you know that zero degrees Celsius is equal to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then there's a bonus temperature on there. The 491.67 R stands for Rankine. Uh, Rankine is the absolute temperature scale that goes with Fahrenheit. So um, zero degrees Rankine and zero degrees Kelsey, uh, Kelvin are both the exact same temperature. They're the coldest temperature you can get. Um, but Fahrenheit degrees go up by a smaller increment of temperature change than degrees Celsius do. And so... Um, you have a much uh, bigger number there for Rankine than you do Kelvin. You don't need to worry too much about Rankine. We're mostly going to be working in Celsius and Kelvin. Just wanted you to know those were there. And then finally, volume. Volume is pretty straightforward, right? Volume is the amount of space that objects have to move around in. And so in a smaller volume, the, the freedom of objects to move around is less. And then in a larger volume, there's much. So those are your kinetic variables um, with respect to the kinetic variables.